In the arid desert near the Dead Sea, a groundbreaking discovery was made in 1947 that would profoundly impact biblical scholarship and confirm the divine inspiration of scripture. The Dead Sea Scrolls, hidden for centuries in the Qumran Caves, included some of the oldest known copies of biblical texts, dating back over 2,000 years. Among these treasures was the Isaiah Scroll, remarkably preserved and dating to about 200 years before the birth of Jesus. This discovery was not just an archaeological marvel, it was a divine revelation. The Dead Sea Scrolls contain numerous manuscripts, including complete books of the Old Testament, fragments and other religious writings of the Jewish community. These texts were virtually identical to the Hebrew Bible used today, affirming the accuracy and preservation of Scripture over millennia. The scrolls included all the books of the Old Testament except for the Book of Esther. The Isaiah scroll in particular provided a direct link to the prophecies about the coming Messiah, written centuries before Jesus walked the earth. Parallel to this, the Septuagint, a Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, was created in the 3rd century BC. This translation was widely used in Hellenistic Jewish communities and later adopted by early Christians. The Septuagint is crucial because it demonstrates that the prophecies and texts were not altered after Jesus' life to fit his narrative. They were established long before his birth. What makes these discoveries so profound is the remarkable consistency found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Septuagint, and the modern Bible. Despite being written by different hands, in different eras, and in different languages, these texts convey the same divine message, underscoring their divine origin. This extraordinary preservation and consistency highlight the meticulous care with which the scriptures were transmitted, guided by the hand of God himself. Isaiah 9 verse 6 foretells, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This prophecy found in both the Septuagint and the Dead Sea Scrolls speaks of a divine child who would come to rule and bring peace. It clearly indicates the dual nature of the Messiah, a child born into humanity who is also divine, bearing titles that belong to God himself. Isaiah 53 verse 3 prophecies. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. This passage vividly describes the Messiah's rejection and suffering, which were fulfilled in the life of Jesus. He was despised by many and endured immense suffering as recorded in the Gospels. Isaiah 7 verse 14 states, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. Asterisk, asterisk, fulfillment, asterisk, asterisk, Matthew 1 verse 22 to 23 recounts. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Isaiah's prophecy of a virgin birth was a significant sign to the Jewish people. It was fulfilled in the birth of Jesus to the Virgin Mary, as recorded in the Gospel of Matthew. The name Emmanuel, meaning God with us, signifies Jesus as God incarnate dwelling among humanity. Isaiah 35 verse 5 to 6 foretells, Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer, and the mute tongue shout for joy. Asterisk, asterisk, fulfillment, asterisk, asterisk, Matthew, 11 verse 4 to 5 records, Jesus saying, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear. 
The dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Isaiah's prophecy depicted the Messiah performing miraculous healings and bringing restoration. Jesus' miracles affirmed his identity as the Messiah and symbolized the spiritual healing he brought to humanity. Psalm 22 verse 16 to 18 predicts, Dogs surround me, a pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Asterisk, asterisk, fulfillment. Asterisk, asterisk, Matthew 27, verse 35 to 46 narrates. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. This prophecy, written centuries before crucifixion was even practiced, vividly describes the events of Jesus' crucifixion, the piercing of his hands and feet, the casting of lots for his clothing, and his suffering on the cross fulfilled the details foretold in the Psalms. They divided up his clothes by casting lots. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lima sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew 27, verse 35 to 46. Psalm 22 vividly describes the crucifixion centuries before this method of execution was even invented. The piercing of hands and feet, the casting of lots for clothing, and the cry of abandonment are all fulfilled in Jesus' crucifixion, confirming his role as the suffering servant. Isaiah 53 verse 5 states, But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Fulfillment 1 Peter 2 verse 24 echoes this prophecy. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Isaiah's prophecy of the suffering servant highlights the purpose of the Messiah's suffering to bear the sins of humanity and provide healing through his sacrifice. Jesus' crucifixion directly fulfilled this prophecy, providing atonement for sin. Zechariah 11 verse 12 to 13 prophecies. I told them, if you think it best, give me my pay, but if not, keep it. So they paid me thirty pieces of silver, and the Lord said to me, Throw it to the potter, the handsome price at which they valued me. So I took the thirty pieces of silver and threw them to the potter at the house of the Lord. Fulfillment, Matthew 26 verse 14 to 15 recounts, Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. Zechariah's prophecy foretold the betrayal of the Messiah for 30 pieces of silver, a price fulfilled when Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus. The detail of Judas later throwing the silver into the temple and its use to purchase the potter's field fulfills the prophecy to its smallest detail. Psalm 16 verse 10 declares, Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. Fulfillment, Acts 2 verse 31 explains, Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. David's prophecy in Psalm 16 promised that God would not allow his Holy One to see decay. This prophecy was fulfilled in the resurrection of Jesus, who rose from the dead on the third day without his body undergoing decay. Peter cites this prophecy in Acts to affirm Jesus' resurrection and his divine nature. The consistency of these prophecies across the Septuagint, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the modern Bible all written centuries apart, provides compelling evidence of divine inspiration. These prophecies, fulfilled in the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, 
underscore the miraculous nature of the scriptures and affirm that they are indeed the word of God, guiding us to the truth of Jesus as the promised Messiah. These fulfilled prophecies are not the only evidence of Jesus' life and divinity. Non-Christian sources provide additional confirmation of his historical existence and significance, further validating the New Testament's accounts. In his Annals, written around A.D. 116, the Roman historian Tacitus refers to Jesus, whom he calls Christus, and his execution under Pontius Pilate during the reign of Emperor Tiberius. Tacitus writes, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations, called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. Annals 15 verse 44. This account not only confirms the crucifixion of Jesus, but also establishes the early existence of Christianity, recognized and persecuted by Roman authorities. The Jewish historian Flavius Josephus in his Antiquities of the Jews, written around AD 93 to 94, makes a significant reference to Jesus in Book 18. Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him. For he appeared to them alive again the third day, as the divine prophets had foretold these and ten thousand other wonderful things concerning him. And the tribe of Christians so named from him are not extinct at this day. Antiquities 18 verse 3. Though some debate its authenticity, this passage provides a valuable reference to Jesus' existence and the early Christian movement with claims of his resurrection aligning with New Testament accounts. In A.D. 112, Pliny the Younger, the Roman governor of Bithynia, wrote to Emperor Trajan about the Christians in his province. In his letter, Pliny describes the worship practices of Christians. They were accustomed to meet on a fixed day before dawn and sing responsively a hymn to Christ as to a God, letters 10.96. Pliny's observations confirm the early Christians' belief in Jesus as God and their unwavering faith despite persecution. These historical accounts from Tacitus, Josephus, and Pliny the Younger, alongside the fulfillment of centuries-old prophecies, validate the New Testament's portrayal of Jesus. They confirm his crucifixion, resurrection, and the rapid growth of Christianity in the ancient world. The alignment of prophecy, scripture, and historical records affirms the truth of Jesus as the promised Messiah and underscores the miraculous nature of God's word. They provide an external, non-Christian perspective that reinforces the accuracy and historical reliability of the biblical narrative, supporting the claim that Jesus of Nazareth was indeed a historical figure whose life, death, and resurrection were witnessed and recorded by both followers and skeptics alike. The unwavering faith of the apostles and early Christians is one of the most compelling testimonies to the truth of the resurrection and the divinity of Jesus Christ. These early followers of Jesus were not only willing to preach and teach his message, but were also prepared to face persecution and death rather than renounce their faith. Their martyrdom serves as a powerful testament to the authenticity of their witness and the profound impact of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Peter, one of Jesus' closest disciples, was crucified upside down in Rome around AD 64-68 under Emperor Nero. According to early Christian writings, Peter requested to be crucified upside down because he felt unworthy to die in the same manner as Jesus. His unwavering faith and humility in the face of death are recorded in sources such as the Acts of Peter. Paul, formerly known as Saul of Tarsus, was a zealous persecutor of Christians before his dramatic conversion to Christianity. 
He became one of the most influential apostles, spreading the gospel throughout the Roman Empire. Paul was beheaded in Rome around AD 64 to 68, also under Nero's reign. In his letters, such as 2 Timothy 4 verse 6 to 7, Paul reflects on his readiness to die for his faith. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. James, the brother of John and one of Jesus' inner circle, was the first apostle to be martyred. He was executed by the sword on the orders of King Herod Agrippa, beyond around A.D. 44, as recorded in Acts 12, verse 1 to 2. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church. Intending to persecute them, he had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. Stephen, one of the first deacons of the early church, was also the first Christian martyr. His bold proclamation of the gospel and his vision of Jesus standing at the right hand of God led to his being stoned to death by the Jewish authorities. His martyrdom is detailed in Acts 7, verse 54 to 60, which concludes with Stephen's prayer. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Thomas, known for his initial doubt about Jesus' resurrection, traveled far to spread the gospel, eventually reaching India. According to tradition, Thomas was martyred by being pierced with spears by soldiers. His unwavering commitment to sharing the gospel, despite knowing the risks, underscores the strength of his faith. Ignatius, an early Christian writer and bishop of Antioch, was arrested and transported to Rome, where he was martyred around A.D. 107. During his journey, Ignatius wrote several letters to early Christian communities, expressing his eagerness to die for Christ. I am God's wheat and I shall be ground by the teeth of beasts that I may become the pure bread of Christ. Letter to the Romans. These accounts of martyrdom highlight the apostles and early Christians' unwavering faith and willingness to face death rather than deny their belief in Jesus Christ. Their willingness to die for their faith serves as a powerful testament to the truth of the resurrection and the divinity of Jesus. People do not willingly face persecution and death for what they know to be a lie. The fact that these individuals chose martyrdom over renouncing their faith strongly supports the authenticity of their testimony and the reality of Jesus' resurrection. The Bible contains numerous passages where Jesus explicitly declares his divinity, affirming his identity as the Son of God. These declarations are foundational to Christian belief, illustrating Jesus' unique relationship with the Father and his role in the salvation of humanity. In Exodus 3 verse 14, God reveals his name to Moses. I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. This declaration signifies God's eternal self-existent nature. Jesus echoes this divine name in John 8 verse 58. Very truly I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. This statement caused an immediate reaction among his Jewish audience who recognized it as a direct claim to divinity, equating himself with the eternal God of Israel. In John 10, verse 30, Jesus declares, I and the Father are one. This statement signifies a deep, intrinsic unity in essence and purpose. It led to an immediate attempt by his audience to stone him for blasphemy, as they understood him to be claiming equality with God. In John 14, verse 6, Jesus proclaims, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This declaration highlights Jesus as the exclusive path to God, embodying divine truth and life. By claiming to be the only way to the Father, Jesus asserts his unique and essential role in humanity's redemption and access to eternal life. In John 14 verse 9, Jesus further explains his divine identity to his disciples. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. This statement underscores Jesus as the perfect representation of God the Father, revealing his nature and character. For a deeper understanding of Jesus' divinity, refer to Colossians 1 verse 15 to 20 and Hebrews 1 verse 3. If this message has touched your heart and you feel called to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I invite you to pray with me. Lord Jesus, I acknowledge that you are the Son of God, the Messiah, and my Savior. I believe that you died for my sins and rose again. 
conquering death and offering eternal life. I repent of my sins and invite you into my heart. Transform my life with your love and grace. I commit to following you and growing in my faith. Thank you for your sacrifice and the gift of salvation. Amen. If you've prayed this prayer, we encourage you to reach out in the comments below. If you enjoyed this content, consider supporting us by clicking the super thanks button below. Your support helps us continue sharing the transformative story of Jesus. Don't forget to subscribe for more videos. Thanks for watching and check out the video on your screen.